Welcome back to the Core EM Podcast. Core content for anyone, anywhere, and just in time. This is the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue EM Residency Program. I'm Anand Swami Nathan, and I'm joined today by one of our fourth-year medical students, Carl Prickshitis. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thanks, Swami. I'm happy to be here. All right, so Carl, you recently put a blog post together on the initial assessment of the trauma patient, and today we're going to review and kind of hone in on some of the highlights of that post. Now, what got you interested in this specific topic? As I was going through uh, my EM rotations as a student, uh, you know, I helped out with uh, patients in the trauma bay, and I was able to assist and observe and learned a lot, um, but I never really learned the steps that the person leading the resuscitation was going through. And I realized the first time that I was asked to see a patient on my own, I didn't really know where to begin, didn't have a good approach to a trauma patient. As a junior resident or a student, it's really important to develop a systematic approach to any common presentation, including trauma, because that gives you a framework to work the patient up. In trauma, this is particularly important given the importance of rapid assessment to deal with potential life threats. You know, one of the things that I think took me a little while to get a handle on was the difference between the different levels of trauma and what patients led to an activation uh, where the call in our ED would be paged overhead and the patient was routed to the trauma slot. And this is going to be different in most of the places that you work or in every place that you work. And we're just going to talk a little bit about what our system is and what the CDC recommends. So when you triage trauma patients from the field, the CDC recommends that if they have physiologic criteria like a BP under 90 or their GCS is less than or equal to 13, if they have an anatomic criteria, so a penetrating injury to the head or the torso, and these things are going to dictate whether the patient should be transferred to a high-level trauma center or they can just be brought to the nearest ED, even if they are a lower designation trauma facility. Criteria for triage at the hospital, again, tend to be similar with the criteria for high-level activations, but there is some difference across institution. There's some flexibility in that, and everybody does this a little bit different. The lower-level activations can often just go to your general emergency department and be assessed there. Right. And I think um, if if you do happen to have EMS bringing a patient in, um, they might give you some information ahead of time. Uh, they'll often call ahead and, and let you know what the that level of trauma activation is going to be, what sort of resources are required. But they also might give you information like the mechanism of injury um, and any vital sign abnormalities that the patient has. As an ED provider, we can sort of use this information to get prepared, ready the team and the supplies and start coming up with a differential of potential injuries we're going to look for and how we're going to manage them before the patient arrives. I think one of the major distinctions in trauma patients is between blunt and penetrating, right? Absolutely. The particular injuries that you're going to be concerned about and the decisions about management of these patients are often broken up into those two broad categories. Now, before the patient arrives, there are some critical things we always have to handle. Get everyone donned in appropriate personal protective equipment. That means gowns, gloves, face masks, and shields. As a team leader, it's critical to assign providers to roles so everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing, what they're responsible for, and that also establishes who the team leader is. The trauma team leader role can get complicated. It gets complicated, especially when more and more people are coming into that. So the trauma surgeon, anesthesia, orthopedics, and we're not going to tackle that today, but that has been addressed in other podcasts. So we're set with our team and equipment. Uh, what do we do next? Once the patient rolls through the doors, unless there's an immediate life threat like agonal respirations or massive bleeding, it's critical to allow EMS to give their handoff. Remember that EMS has been with this patient for 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 minutes or more, depending on how long they had to transfer the patient to you. That means they've done interventions. They know something about the patient. They were on scene. So we have to keep a quiet room and allow our pre-hospital providers to give report to all the team members at one time. Once we get that report, we can start in with the primary survey. The goal of this part of the exam is to address immediate life threats. The mentality here is find it, fix it, fast. The standard approach to the primary survey is the ABCDE mnemonic. It stands for airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. I think a lot of providers originally learn this in terms of a hierarchy of importance where airway takes priority over circulation, for instance, but in reality, all of these elements need to be assessed in parallel. If the patient is hemorrhaging from an amputation, this should be addressed immediately rather than securing the airway first and then coming back to that amputation. 
I think a key element in assessment is developing an approach that you repeat the same way each time. Uh, it really allows you to be efficient as a provider and makes it less likely that you're going to omit a step. So starting right at the top, A for airway. Uh, we're going to look externally for any potential obstructions like facial injuries, blood, or vomit. We're going to have the patient say their name, and we're going to listen carefully for any signs of airway obstruction, any gargling or anything like that. Uh, and then we're going to do a quick assessment of the patient's mental status and determine whether they're able to clear their secretions and keep their tongue from obstructing the airway. Swami, I'd previously heard that a GCS less than eight mandates intubation. What's the current thinking on that? That's still the general ATLS teaching. However, there are certainly scenarios where patients have a low GCS but don't require a tube and vice versa. Unfortunately, we don't have great ways to assess whether a patient is protecting their airway. Presence of a gag reflex, for instance, is not reliable. You really need to look at the clinical picture and make a judgment call, which is hard unless you have a lot of experience. The expected clinical course is a particularly important consideration. If the patient's going off unit for CT or to the OR or to IR, I always consider early intubation because those aren't fun places to do a crash airway. So moving on to our next letter, B for breathing. We're going to inspect and palpate the chest wall for any signs of injury. We're going to look at the position of the trachea and for any JVD as well to get a picture of the patient's uh, work of breathing. We're going to look at the position of the trachea and for any JVD. Uh, we're also going to get a picture of the patient's work of breathing overall. Most patients are going to come in with a C collar, and you usually have to take that down in order to get a good look at the neck for position of the trachea and JVD. There's still some debate about the utility of C collars in general, but they are contraindicated for patients with penetrating trauma and associated with higher mortality in those situations. Moving on with the rest of our uh, B exam, we're going to listen for bilateral breast sounds, and we're going to get the patient's O2 set. Remember that the O2 sat is just a measure of oxygenation. You also want to assess how the patient's ventilating. We can do this with end tidal CO2, which I think is pretty ubiquitous, but there are places that don't have that available. And if you don't have that capnography available, you can get a sense from observing the quality of their respirations. Now we're on to C for circulation. The major thing we're concerned about here is blood loss. So we're going to look for any major sources of external bleeding, and then we're going to do a rapid exam of the major internal compartments that a patient can exsanguinate into. An extended focused assessment with sonography and trauma, or EFAST exam, is done in most departments these days, and it can really help with identifying any sources of internal bleeding. There are generally five locations that a patient can bleed out into the chest cavity, the abdomen and pelvis, the retroperitoneum, long bone fractures like femur fractures, and then externally or to the street. So something that you can't witness, but hopefully your EMS guys can tell you about. In pediatric patients, we also have to worry about head injuries, either scalp lacerations or rarely intracranially. That's a great point. I think uh, we're often told that you can't develop hemorrhagic shock from a head injury and to consider neurologic shock if patients are hypotensive with head injuries. But you might have to give it a second thought in your pediatric patients uh, considering that low blood volume. So with your circulation, hopefully you're getting an early blood pressure and then you're going to want to continue to measure that to assess their circulation to assess how much hemorrhage has actually happened. I think at one point I learned that if you were able to palpate a pulse at a particular location, it was a marker that a patient had a certain blood pressure. Is that true? So once again, this is older teaching from ATLS, and it was suggested that that was true, but a couple of small studies demonstrate that using peripheral pulses was inaccurate and overestimates the systolic blood pressure. Using pulses as a marker of what blood pressure you have is really no longer recommended. So we're going to check those peripheral pulses bilaterally. We're going to assess for presence, quality, and rate, but we're not going to use them as an assessment to determine the patient's volume status. That's absolutely it. And next on our assessment, we've done A, B, and C. So we're moving on to D for disability. Look for any potential CNS injuries, examine the pupils, calculate the GCS, and look for gross movement in all extremities. Finally, we're on to E for exposure. So get those trauma shears out and remove all the clothing from the patient. Once you do that, be sure to have a warm blanket on hand to cover that patient back up. And then with a team of providers, you're going to log roll the patient to assess for any injuries in the back. Now, this part of the primary survey is often combined with a more detailed examination of the back to avoid rolling the patient multiple times. Now that brings us to the end of the primary survey. And I know we stated this up front, but we're going to say it one more time. 
We talked about them serially, but in real life, you're doing these in parallel. They should all be done simultaneously. So we've covered A for airway, B for breathing, C for circulation, D for disability or CNS injuries, and we fully exposed our patient. And of course, Carl, we didn't say this, but having a pair of trauma shears is absolutely critically essential in these patients. And as a junior resident or a med student, it's probably your best friend on a trauma rotation. If we haven't found any major life threats that need immediate intervention on our primary survey and if our patient isn't immediately going to imaging for or the OR, how do we proceed with the rest of the assessment? So once we've dealt with the primary survey, the next component is the secondary survey. Uh, There are two major elements of the secondary survey. The first is a focused history, um, which is remembered with the ample mnemonic. And the second is a comprehensive head-to-toe exam to document all the patient's injuries. Getting a history on a trauma patient can be difficult. Patients may be confused or altered. They may have received sedating medication as part of their management. And what you want to do is try to get whatever information you can from the patient, from any family members, bystanders, EMS, to try to help and fill in some of those details. The mnemonic we use for a focused history in trauma is AMPLE, A-M-P-L-E. And that stands for allergies, medications, past medical history, last meal, and events and environment. You want to keep that history focused and brief, but try to get a clear picture of the specific events uh, leading up to the trauma. I like to ask these patients specifically about blood thinners, as well as head trauma or loss of consciousness, as those things are going to change our management. Yeah, and the allergies one is pretty important as well. Sometimes patients will have like a medic alert bracelet, so you want to look for those too. You don't want to give these patients something that's just going to make things worse and cloud their overall clinical picture. Once you've obtained a focus history, you're going to want to do a really good physical exam and document all of the patient's injuries. The exam is relatively straightforward, starting at the head and proceeding downwards with inspection for bruising, lacerations, abrasions, and palpation for any instability or tenderness. Some of the spots that often get forgotten, Carl, are looking behind the knee, in the armpits, and between the butt cheeks, for lack of a better term, for any kind of penetrating injuries. I think covering the physical exam as well, it's again important to emphasize that really having that systematic approach and doing things the same way each time is going to prevent you from missing those uh, areas where injuries could be hiding. A couple key parts of the head exam are examining the ears for hematympanum and the nose for a septal hematoma. You can look for CSF fluid leakage at both of those locations, the ears and the nose, but it's kind of difficult to detect. Specifically, also looking for bruising behind the ears or around the eyes, known as battle sign and raccoon eyes, are important to look for as they can be signs of a basilar skull fracture. It's also important to get a good view in the mouth for any bleeding or broken teeth. Ask the patient to close their mouth and feel how their teeth align. Moving on to the neck, you want to take that collar down while someone holds C-spine immobilization if it's necessary and look for any injuries, any lacerations, palpate the spinous processes as well for tenderness. Remember that for spinal injuries, we're focused on midline tenderness. So it's important to be specific with where exactly your patient is tender. The exam of the thorax and abdomen are next. We're going to look for bruising and we're going to feel for any tenderness, guarding, and rebound. What do you think about examining the pelvis, Swami? So in general, I don't really recommend it. It was something that we were all taught to do, rocking the pelvis. But I think if there's any true concern for a pelvic injury, I just get the pelvic binder on and avoid any unnecessary manipulation. Some providers will press inwards on the hips to assess for stability, but you certainly don't want to rock the pelvis and run the risk of further injury. There's some data out there that every time you rock the pelvis in an unstable pelvis injury, you lose a unit of blood into the pelvis, which is something I'd like to avoid. And the problem, Carl, is in a teaching institution like where we work, I'm going to feel the pelvis and then I'm going to tell them, oh, it's unstable. And then somebody else is going to feel the pelvis and then somebody else. All of a sudden, you've got 18 people that are rocking the pelvis and that's not good. So if I have a blunt trauma patient with any vital sign abnormalities or I'm worried about a pelvic injury, I place a pelvic binder empirically during my primary survey. And I think that probably highlights to other providers hands off the pelvis. Absolutely. Now for the extremities. Uh, We're going to check that they're neurovascularly intact. Uh, We're going to examine and palpate for any injuries, range those joints and check for any instability, and then it's on to examination of the back. Like I said before, you might want to include this as part of the primary survey to avoid rolling the patient multiple times. But once the patient's rolled over, you're going to look for any obvious injuries and palpate the spinous processes for any tenderness or step-offs. 
Usually this would be followed by a digital rectal exam, but does everybody need one? Again, doing a digital rectal exam on all trauma patients was part of the original ATLS guidelines, right? I mean, I'm sure that you've heard from your surgeons and many other people out there have that the only reason to not do a digital rectal exam is that you don't have a finger or the patient doesn't have a butt. Several studies in the 2000s, though, suggested that DRE rarely changes management and it's not a useful screening test. Furthermore, it's invasive. It can be distressing to our patients. The most recent version of ATLS recommends selectively doing a DRE before inserting a urinary catheter, but even that recommendation, Carl, I find kind of silly. I've never felt a high-riding prostate. I don't know that I would know what one felt like if I did, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense in most scenarios. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the literature for that assessment has not really borne out as being very sensitive for any sort of injuries. I think historically, the main thing people were concerned about were was assessing rectal tone as a marker of potential spinal cord injuries. But the value I was able to find for sensitivity was only about 37%. Whether the patient has sacral sparing in a spinal cord injury can give you some information about prognosticating. But you can assess a couple of other reflexes like the anal wink or bubble cavernosis reflex uh, if you want to find out whether they're sacral cord sparing. I think a lot of providers uh, still do a screening test for motor function of L5 and S2, and they have the patient squeeze their butt cheeks uh, to see whether the gluteal muscles are functioning normally. Well, Carl, that's a fantastic review of the initial trauma assessment. Let's wrap things up with a couple of take-home points. Sure. So development of a systematic approach is essential to rapidly assessing the wide diversity of trauma patients. It's also going to minimize any missed injuries. You want to prepare with whatever information is available before the patient arrives, and remember to get a good handoff from the pre-hospital team. Start in with the primary survey, the A, B, C, D, E's, and address those immediate life threats. Finally, round out your assessment with a good medical history, and remember to complete a comprehensive head-to-toe exam. That's fantastic, Carl. I just want the listeners to know that Carl is currently matching into emergency medicine at the release of this podcast. So we want to wish him good luck in his match process. Carl, we've gotten to work together. You've done quite a bit of work for the Corey M site, and it's been fantastic. And whoever gets you is going to be quite lucky. Not that I'm pitching to anyone in particular, but I'm just saying they're going to be quite lucky to have you. And obviously, we're going to be really looking forward to having you back on the podcast soon. Thanks so much, Swami. It's been a real pleasure working with you the last couple months. All right. That's all for the Core EM podcast this week. Come on over and check out the site at coreem.net. We've got a ton of great core content emergency medicine. We'll have a core post up on Wednesday and a journal update up on Thursday. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page, follow us on Google Plus, and on Twitter where our handle is at core underscore EM. Thanks, and see you all next week.